Grid Scan, Sentinels, Bloodline, by Natsu Uesugi, Audio Drama, Chapter 2, Part 3, Dolphin and the Prophetess. Blood Paradox Twinkling light glinted off the mirrored blinds, dancing before Lino's eyes. As he blinked, the morning sunlight drowning him in its warmth, his eyelid fluttering at the bright as the glare blinded. Seventeen years old, Lino rolled onto his back, chest exposed, as he raised his right hand to the ceiling, fingers splayed, the sun's glare filtering through his digits. He squinted at the daggered chandelier above his head, reflecting the glistening rays as they jumped and spun, the cylindrical hollow light floating overhead, escaping its shelf in the far corner as it responded to its master's movements in the bed we had slept restlessly last night. His mind clouded by disturbing nightmares of death and carnage as yet another vision danced in his mind once again. These views from the deep had plagued him more of late, disturbing his sleep. When he confided in Shannon, the weapons master, said they were just dreams, but Lino knew better. He knew the teachings of the prophet religion in the parable of Thoth, their sacred religious text. He had the dreams for years as a child, but then they disappeared on his 11th birthday, only to come raging back since his 17th birthday a few days prior. The dreams tortured his sleep, keeping him awake, tossing and turning, in a fearful sweat of moaning and phantom pains throughout his body for the last seven days, like a plague he could not escape. Lino continued staring at the ceiling as the door to his bedroom opened, the blinds on the side windows pushed back over the cushions on the window seat that he had made for his assignment at IHS Academy of the Arts, his college. The light from the sun bathed him in blissful orange warm as he shielded his eyes, trying to black out the blinding glare. The butler, Bowery, fussed around in the closet, then came over and laid his clothes on the bed as Lino sat up, looking down on the black high-collar jacket, his ceremonial gear that was only to be worn at official state business. It meant the emperor was near. From the other side of the planet, from the home of the Pacific Territories, the Genesee Islands. Young Master Lino, it is time for you to wake up. I have laid out your clothes for the day. Today it shall be full ceremonial dress. Lino's left hand rubbed the black ceremonial jacket with a gold brocade laurel floater lace cross on the right stand-up collar. The design, the ceremonial mark of House Dejar, the lineage and bloodline of the Viceroy of the Pacific Territories. Full dress? Why now, Bowery? There are no official meetings on the calendar today. Lino snaked the white shirt from under the dark, crisply iron jacket, pulling it on over his shoulders. His silent brown knickers he slept in had the intricate pattern house de jar fleur de lis embroidered sigils, the golden sparkling thread shining in the artificial light of the hollow robe hovering at the ceiling that moved with him. This is not an official meeting for the Viceroy, young master. This is a meeting for you. The first consort requested me to prepare you for the meeting. The Emperor's Prophet Trans Chandler Justine shall evaluate you this morning. Morning, Bowery. It is the middle of the night. It is three after midnight, young master. It is morning. Lino yawned, bored of Bowery's use of formal, ceremonial, honorific language, as he always did with the young master. Semantics, Bowery, quite irritating. Evaluate me? Why? It's not for me to know. I'm just a butler. I'm here to get you dressed, that is all. But Bowery, young lord, please. All your training has led you here. Do not disappoint your father. The viceroy put his faith in you. If you fail this meet, you shall dishonor House de Jar. A dishonor that shall take decades to repair, if it can be repaired at all. Lino chuckled. Repair? That takes decades? Can't be true, Bowery. Dishonor your father early in the morning. Ascending reverberated in his head. 
Lino jerked, turning, looking behind him towards the door. The maid's seven-year-old daughter, Jacqueline, hovering, holding her blue-eared bunny rabbit with a wicked smile that spoke volumes. Lino sent in response, Jackie, what do you mean? Mr. Bunny told me it's true. There are many that would want to kill you, Lino. If you fail this meat, know your body shall lie at Justine's feet dead. I've seen the signs. Mr. Bunny does not lie. It is the Viceroy who fears your power. Your continued defiance scares the triumvirate. Jackie shook her stuffed bunny over her head, then hugged it hard, smirking. Fears my power. I have no power. Lino fastened his pants. Oh, but you do. But I... Jackie interrupted, rubbing up to him, taking the stuffed animal in his face hard, glaring at him angry all of a sudden, her eyes palpable. Mr. Bunny says that Justine offers, do not drink, it is poison. Trust your instincts. Like I see, you see. The sight, your dreams are real. Trust your instincts. They shall save you. That is Mr. Bunny's vision. Jackie slapped Mr. Bunny at Lino's chest, jerking fast, then turned, skipping away down the hall out of sight. Lino was perplexed at Jackie's words, but trusted her vision. The words she said were from Mr. Bunny. He knew Jackie was the maid's daughter. He knew, unspoken, she was his half-sister, his father's daughter. He saw it in Jackie's heart that the Viceroy had taken her mother, the maid, to his bed. But seven years ago, at the same time, his mother, the first consort, Juliana, was also carrying the Viceroy's child, Alessandra. Juliana didn't know about Jackie's lineage. No one spoke of it. The maid was kept close, saying nothing. He just felt it. Lino figured, then maid stayed as one of Hallett Hall's servants to keep her close. And Jackie, the psychic child with prophetic visions that tortured under House Dadar's control. Jackie's blood called out to him like only those with a psychic blood bond could. It was not something that could be learned. It was the CODIS, the psychic power, instinctual from the great Lord Thoth and Llewellyn. Lino buttoned his shirt, pulling on the dark starched pants after taking off the knickers. Putting on the jacket, Bowery approached him, buttoning for the young prince, as Lino stood perfectly still. Lino inquired, Justine is the Emperor's Trans Chandler. Why does she, she want to see me? I hold no station. A voice from the door answered, causing Lino to turn, seeing his mother, Juliana, the first consort, leaning up against the doorway with her arms crossed, looking radiant, as always. Lino sat down on the bed once Bowery had finished to put on his shoes. You are heir to House de Jar, first son of the first consort. Young one, it is time. Come, we must not keep the honorable prophetess. The emperor's seer, Justine, is awaiting you. But mother... Juliana came up to him, gently touching his cheek lovingly, as she smiled softly. A sort of warm lust for her filling his loins as he moved in close, her right hip touching his left thigh, making him twitch as he felt his body respond to her. You look tired. Bowery interrupted, causing Lino to step back, forcing his teenage hormones from getting the better of him. You are the bloodline, young master. It's for the best. The Empire requires your honor with the prophetess. She represents the Emperor. My honor? Lino looked deeply into Bowery's eyes, which turned black that of a changeling. Come. Juliana grabbed her son's wrist, pulling it out of the room and down the front stairs where an imperial escort was waiting for him, lined up in the hall in rows. Lino turned back to his mother. Go with Shannon to the palace. I cannot accompany you. This is your destiny. Mother, destiny? Shannon of the imperial guard stepped in front of Lino and unrolled a scroll, reading in a loud voice. Emiliano Patrice de Jar, son of Charles de Jar, heir to the Viceroy Stone of the Pacific Territories. You are summoned by the Empress Trans Chandler, the Honorable Lady, the Prophet Mother Justine. She orders you come. 
thou shalt come, as so the prophet's words. What say you, young Lord Dijon? Lena looked over at his mother, with Bowery standing behind her shoulder, who nodded at him as his mother batted her eyelashes and pitched her head to the side, urging his compliance, her fingers making a hand sign from the secret prophet teaching, calling him to obey. Shannon spoke up, breaking Lena's days. You are the fourth future of House Sija. What word, young prince? Lino put a hand at its heart, bowing his head ever so slightly, acknowledging Shannon, and thumped his chest with his fist twice, nodding visibly, snapping his heels. For I, Emiliano Patrice de Jar, heir to House de Jar, shall obey this summons for the honor of House de Jar. I shall come to the Prophet Mother, the Empress Chance Chandler Justine. Shannon rolled up the scroll, putting it under his arm as he snapped his heels. So shall it be ordered, so shall it be done. Turning on his heels, the Imperial Guard procession stepped in front of Lino, who followed by Shannon as he exited the foyer down the front steps of the Hallett Hall house onto a cavalcade of black armored vehicles. Shannon stepped into the middle car, closing the door as a cavalry took off out of the circular driveway on their way to the Viceroy's palace. Arriving at the palace, Lino followed after Shannon through the foyer and into the Imperial Ballroom, the Phoenix Ballroom, to the ceremonial throne at the front of the room. The prophetess, Lady Justine, was seated on the Viceroy's throne with two rows of prophet lay attendants dressed in white lining the sides of the room. The Lady Justine's skin was white as porcelain, unnatural, her long, shining, silver-white hair in an elaborate hairdo with braids and white papillion butterflies adorning her forehead with a silver ringlet crown. Her fingers were covered in long, pointed, silvery, deadly dagger-sharp nails, each blade with a different poison. The rows of attendants were deadly, trained in martial arts from the Prophet Shrine in the city. Prophet lay priestesses in their own rights, all virgins, who had sworn their words to silence for the rest of their days in the service of Justine until the day her life was extinguished. As Shannon came into the room, Lino turned as the ballroom door was closed behind him. Shannon got down on one knee in front of Lino and put a hand to his heart and spoke. I have brought the Dauphin to see the Prophet as requested. The room was silent, then a low buzzing in his brain from the prophetess's codas power, an unspoken psychic command underneath the spoken words. His eyes, they wield the rage of a teenager, not in control of the surging hormones or his emotions. Shannon, you may go. Leave the abomination with me. When Lino heard descending under the words, Come here, creature. Are you an animal? Or are you human? Speak only once we are alone. Thank you, my lady. Shannon stood up, backing out of the room, as if he had not heard the codis beneath the words. Slowly, his footsteps forced, too slow on purpose, his gait overly rigid. Turning, Lino watched Shannon retreat, catching fingers, making the hand sign for caution. The door shut behind Shannon, Lino in the room alone with the prophetess, as her sending rang out, Come here. Lino felt himself compelled to move, his right foot lifting, then stifled himself, hesitating, tapping his heel, remaining in place, defiant. Interesting. You resist? One of the prophet's lay priestesses lining the wall approached Lino with a tray with a small glass. She came up to him, offering, drink. Lino took the glass as the woman retreated and brought it up to his lips, watching the prophetess closely, his eyes on her. Her face did not change as he smelled the glass and slowly turned it over and poured it out onto the floor. I shall not drink your poison, Lino exclaimed, and sent responding, then threw the glass on the floor. It came to rest at the feet 
of the prophet lay priestess who had offered it. The prophet lay priestess fell to her knees, hands over her eyes, whispering, The prophecy, the sun will see the truth in it and shall not drink. Another lay priestess dropped to her knees, The sun shall see and save himself. You are dismissed. Be gone. Justine shouted, her sending assaulting, causing Lino pain. The lay priestesses on the two rows at the walls left out the back from behind the throne, leaving Lino alone with Justine as the door closed. The door to the back closing loud as Lino stood in silence as Justine studied him with her eyes, ravaging his mind, reading his thoughts, intruding on his psyche. Your mother has spoken well of you, while your father, the Viceroy, calls you abomination. One of them is correct. The other is an error. Tell me, boy, which one is correct? Tell me of your dreams. I am not privy to what you know, Honorable Justine. You know I have dreams. Yet you invade my mind. Find these visions you accuse me of yourself, barked Lino. You're quite defiant, just as they said you were. Interesting. Lino frowned, feeling she was lying. Who is they? What do your instincts say, young lord? Read me like you read the poison. So it was poison. Of course, my boy. The Viceroy cannot have an animal for a son. Abomination, yes. Wild, feral dog, no. Lino's eyebrows twitched as he tried to control his reaction, the word abomination stabbing at his fragile teenage ego as it always did, but worse from her than when it was whispered by his father. That word abomination hurts you, I see. Do you know why? Testine met his eyes, causing Lino to turn away and look at his shiny black shoes, feeling the tendrils of her mind infiltrate and ravaging his soul, stripping him of his defenses. Come here. Lino's body moved to her voice, not under his control, gliding across the floor as he came to stand before her, getting down on one knee, right hand at his heart, his head bound. Good. You obey the word when it suits you, child. That voice in your head... Listen to it. It shall save your life. Lino gasped, the words hitting him deep. What? Justine stood up and came to Lino, touching the tip of her index finger to his forehead with the end of the steel tip covering the digit. Tell me, young one, do the visions you see in your dreams often come true as you see them? Lino hesitated as he felt a tingle at his forehead, compelled to answer. Mostly my dreams happen as I see them. The visions frighten me. Sometimes they even intrude when I'm awake. What are these dreams? Visions of war, carnage, blood, mobile frames attacking the city, deadly riots in the Eftilons, refugees gunned down crossing into the zone to find freedom. How do these dreams make you feel? They terrify me. Justine went back to sit on the throne in silence as Lino kept his eyes on the floor for a moment, then looked up, seeing her make a hand gesture, the door behind him opening again. Shannon's voice rang out as he returned. You called, prophetess? Tell the viceroy his son, the young human, has survived his trial. He is protected by the Trans-Channeler Enclave. He shall not be harmed. Yes, my lady. Shannon appeared, trapping Lino on the shoulder who stood up. Come with me. Lino followed Shannon to the door, but she sent to him as he was about to exit, causing him to turn back. What is it, my boy? Lino made the sign of thought as his forehead as his eyes lit up. Justine's eyes opened wide, fear overtaking her face as she grabbed the bangles at her left wrist, playing with them nervous. Lino looked her right in the eyes. What does God tell you when you look into the abyss? 
His voice rang out, sending underneath the words. She hesitated, words trapped, caught in her throat. He just... Lino smirked, blinking. Do you see me there, staring back at you? Dustine gasped, bringing fists to her lips. Lino, that voice. Beware, prophetess. When I see you, Thos sees you. Little Wellowin sees you. Think before you do something stupid. Lino's eyes stopped glowing as he turned back, moving towards the door, and placed his fingernails on the thick, ebony black engravings of angels and flying creatures that graced the Phoenix ballroom doorway. Dragging his fingers across the black, nails scraping like death of cannon fire, he sent to her one last time. Remember who I am. His voice like that of something beyond the deep. The door slammed behind him, leaving Justine alone to contemplate her fate, the abomination. His words, the words of the great Lord Toss. End chapter two, part three.